with Laura Coonsbeg. Morning. Times are hard. But Sir Keir Starmer reckons he has the solutions to the country's long list of problems. So does he? Miles ahead in poll after poll, in front month after month. Slowly filling in the gaps on what he'd actually do in power. But will Labour's lead hold when Keir Starmer's sometimes still shy of revealing it all? I know that news about the pay review body recommendations will be on the minds of many public sector workers today. Those recommendations will, of course, be subject to negotiation. I don't think it's helpful for me to wade into that. Not saying yes or no to his rival's attempt to end public sector strikes. Today's offer is final. There will be no more talks on pay. We will not negotiate again on this year's settlements. And no amount of strikes will change our decision. Labour will not promise goodies for all. Nothing tighter than his grip on the chequebook. Instead, he promises change. So as he joins us this morning, what does Keir Starmer mean by reform or bust? He's here for our final big interview before the summer break. Keir Starmer is live. The Trade Secretary, who also last year at least wanted to be the Prime Minister, Cami Badenoch, joins us from New Zealand, where she's just signed us up to one of the biggest trading blocks in the world. And forget Wimbledon, what about the Women's Football World Cup? We'll talk to a Matilda, Sarah Walsh, former Aussie football star and a host of the tournament. Morning, morning. For the last time this summer, welcome to you and to my panel today, Dame Sharon White, the chair of John Lewis, Ollie Dugmore from Politics Joe and Dame Andrea Leadsom, former Conservative Cabinet Minister. Welcome to you all. Why have one dame if you can have two? Good morning. Let's start, of course, with what's making the news this morning. The newspapers all have different takes today. The Sunday Express says there's going to be a £12 trillion Brexit trade boost. Well, we'll talk about that trade deal a bit later. Uh, the Mail on Sunday says Prince George will be able to skip the tradition of going into the armed forces when he's older. The Sunday Times says that Defence Secretary Ben Wallace is off and is warring of war on three fronts. And the Observer splashes on Keir Starmer telling the Labour Party it cannot spend its way back to power. A lot more of that later. Andrea, first of all to you, the departure of Ben Wallace, he's a very well-respected minister in mm. the Conservative Party. It's not exactly a great vote of confidence in Rishi Sunak, is it? Well, as, as he said himself, he's had several years in the job. He's one of the longest serving um, people in that job as Secretary of State for Defence. And he feels his time is up and that's completely reasonable. I think we owe him a big debt of gratitude. He's done a great job at a very, very difficult time. You know, he's, he's really, I think, demonstrated on behalf of the government a real commitment to supporting Ukraine. And actually, when you look back on it, it isn't a no-brainer that we are supporting Ukraine and helping them to fight back the Russians. There is a world in which Russia did invade Ukraine and then what would have been next? So I think UK determination to get the rest of the world, the rest of Europe and the United States to really support Ukraine is in small part due to, to Ben's own determination. But happy politicians don't walk away from big jobs and there are more than 40 MPs who've said they'll leave the Conservative Party at the next election. I mean, it does give a sense that people are looking at what's on offer and thinking, I don't want part of that anymore. I don't quite see it like that. Um, yeah, I think it is exhausting. You know, I've been an MP now for 13 years and actually things have changed a lot. Mm. You know, the, the, the harassment on social media, for example, the vitriol in the press. People do get tired of it, actually. And so I, th I think a, a lot of the colleagues who are walking away from it now are just thinking, so no, I want to do something else with my life. Too. Right, we're about yeah. to talk to Keir Starmer. Um, now, Sharon White, you've done many big jobs and you were very senior at the Treasury for some time. He's very clear now, Labour's not going to be a party of big spending. Do you think that's the right course? I think what's um, I think what's interesting is obviously that you know spending is going to be tight whoever's in government over the next couple of years, but I think there is still scope for some big and bold action on whether it's housing, whether it's planning, whether it's education. 
Um, so I think what I would be looking for is to see a government that's taking bold, decisive action. Obviously, for many people up and down the country, the big issue is cost of living, mm. bills going up, and that has to be addressed. And we'll hear that in a second. And only for your audience, you know, your website basically caters a lot to, to, to young people. What would be the number one thing that you think your audience would like to hear from Keir Starmer today? Housing. I want to keep it brief. One thing, it's housing. <laughs> and housing in what way? Building them. Um, let's, let's see a million a year for the first term of a Labour government. I'd love to hear something like that from Keir Starmer. And Changing. using taxpayers' money? Uh, could do. You could borrow as well. Borrowing still interest. I know they're higher than they have been recently, but historically, if you look at trends, um, historically low. And I think the social good from something like house building, as well as many other policy mm -hmm. platforms you could adopt, um, the social good outweighs the financial cost of doing okay. it, in my well, view. Well, there's the shopping list from you too. We'll hear from Keir Starmer in just a second. But first, cast your mind back three years. Labour had been hammered at the election. And a fresh-faced Keir Starmer's first job was to pull the party back from the brink. But winning next time round seems pretty much impossible. But now, with a strong and sustained lead in the polls, it looks like he might just do it. But so much has changed since then. Believe it or not, winning might be the easy part. Here's a reminder of some of the problems that have been piling up. I feel anxious on behalf of our patients and their families uh, around the delays to, to, to care. And that's a cumulative effect of the strikes. The last six, 12 months have been more challenging than I've ever known in the time I've worked here. The cost of living has gone up so much. People are going to be struggling with mortgages. I can't downsize any smaller unless I lived in a shoebox. There's gas bills, electric bills, and it's just too hard. They're getting stopped and brought, and then they're getting taken wherever, to hotels and everything like that, and there's people here on the breadline that don't have any money to eat. If we don't act now, this world will not be the world which we would wish anyone to live in. Well, he's here. Let's get on with it. Welcome Good to morning. the studio. Looking at all of that, are you sure you want the job? Well, look, looking at that, I think that's a list of the failures of the last 13 years. Um, all of those very human stories show the impact of a failure to grow our economy. Our economy hasn't grown significantly over the last 13 years. And of course, then we had the kamikaze budget last year that you know, did even more harm and, you know, it is, it's working people who pay the price of this Tory chaos. Does the situation that we're in call for someone who's going to do things really differently, very differently? Yes, we have to have a complete change in the way that we govern. Um, and that's why, uh, since we last sat here, mm -hmm. I've set out Labour's five missions for government, the big things that we want to achieve, the change that we want to see under a Labour government. And what I've concentrated on there is not the sticking plaster, uh, dealing with the immediate problem, but actually fixing the fundamentals, whether that's growing the economy, we want the fastest or the highest sustained growth in the G7, whether that's uh, NHS not just back on its feet, but fit for the future, breaking the class ceiling when it comes to education, making sure that no longer are children and young people, um, their future determined by the earnings and income of their parents, dealing with safer streets and, of course, making sure that we have clean power by 2030, which will make a massive difference to not just bills, but energy security. So you've done there your equivalent of Rishi Sunak's five pledges and the things that you would want to fix for the long term in future. But you, so you say you need to do things very differently. Let's test out what you might do differently if you were prime minister, because there is an immediate problem at the moment with public sector pay. Yes. So Rishi Sunak has offered doctors a 6% pay rise. They say no. He says no more talking. What would you do? Well, this is the government's problem. They, as good as broke our public services, they've created a situation in which wages have been stagnant for many, but many years. But what would years. you do differently and they in need that to situation? Sort out, they need to sort out this mess. How? I would do this differently by growing the economy. We have to grow, grow, and grow our economy. And you said that already, that this is a specific question. If you were Prime Minister right now, it's exactly the kind of problem that might face you, a pay dispute with a big, powerful union, the doctors say they will not accept it. Rishi Sunak says no more negotiating. What would you do? Do you back the junior doctors or do you back the prime minister? Well, we would be round the table negotiating and we would settle this dispute. I think many people would say, why has it taken this long even to have one step towards progress? Because many people have had their operations cancelled. Many people have been deeply affected by these strikes. 
Uh, under the last Labour government, we settled disputes. Mm -hmm. We didn't have, I mean, take the nursing dispute. You didn't have a national nursing dispute under the last Labour government. So right what you now, did have was if you were lower Minister, waiting lists you would keep negotiating. and higher confidence in would, the NHS. But you would keep negotiating, and the implication of that is that you would offer them more. Well, Laura, look, uh, the election will be sometime next year. We will inherit whatever situation we inherit. But you but want to be Prime Minister. Task... But you want to be Prime Minister. This is exactly the kind of thing that might face you. Doctors will not accept 6%. You say the government should keep negotiating. The implication of that is they should offer more than 6%. This is the government's mess, and it's for them to sort it out. I'm and not going to wade what into you that. Would do. What I would do if we were in power is I would be absolutely laser focused on growing the economy with a plan for growing the economy. I would also be laser focused on reforming our public services to make sure that we take the weight off our public services. And we'll services. talk about that in just a second, but do you not think some of our viewers might hear when you say, I don't want to wade in? They think, well, hang on a minute, Keir Starmer's trying to persuade me he wants to be prime minister. He would be very different. He would get things done. And you say, I don't want to wade in. Well, Laura, no leader of the opposition is going to sit in a TV studio saying the precise percentage that they would um, you know, agree in hypothetical discussions. I'm not even in the room for these negotiations. Mm. Um, what I would do is approach this very, very differently in government. We would negotiate, mm. but the most important thing is to get to the root cause. The root cause of this is the economic failure of the last 13 years. We've got to turn that around. So let's talk about, as you mentioned there, reform, public sector reform. And you've said this morning, when it comes to public services, it is not about money, it is reform or bust. So can you explain what that actually means in practice? Because politicians like to use that R word a lot. It's sometimes hard to understand what it means. Well, the first thing is economic responsibility and stability. I think uh, anybody who saw what happened to our economy last autumn with the kamikaze mini budget knows that the first rule of politics of government has to be um, responsible economics and so we will start from that place but and we will reform because the responsible economics gives us the, the foundation the platform on which to build but we reform as well and we need to reform for a number of reasons first it's the failure to reform over the last 13 years that's caused a lot of the problems Secondly, reforming means that we can move forward at pace, taking advantage of technology mm -hmm. and have a better outcome. I've always been a reformer. I ran the Crown Prosecution Service for five years um, and I knew that we had to reform. When I arrived at the Crown Prosecution Service, I went out to our offices. This was in the first month or two and etched on my uh, memory is witnessing a van turn up at one of our offices to take the paper files from my staff to court over the mountains in South Wales. Um, and I thought this was utterly ridiculous and we needed to have a digital file. So we then set about reforming the CPS. But we need to do that with all our public services so that, uh, and wider so that we can actually make the case for the future. But aren't the problems in many of our public services much deeper than having paper sitting around? I mean, people who work in public sectors or people watching this morning might think, well, reform doesn't fix a roof that might be about to fall in in a hospital. We've seen examples of that here in this studio. Reform doesn't take asbestos out of classrooms. What does is money, spending money. Do you believe that public services in this country need more money if they're going to improve? Well, let me just take your example, whether it's asbestos in the roof or there will always be um, issues that need to be resolved. I absolutely get that. But if all we ever do, if our you know, horizon and focus is only on the immediate problems. We will never fix the fundamentals. The NHS is a classic example of mm. this. Every year we have an NHS crisis. Every year we put a sticking plaster on it in about January or February, get to about the middle of the year um, and then breathe because less people are using the health service in the summer and then we go back into another health crisis. We've got to break it. My missions are about breaking out of that. And the reform we need to make will make a massive difference. A bold, but you can have bold time. and reforming. But reform takes well, time. And I don't think anybody watching this would think, yeah, you should just do things the same way forever and ever and ever. But reform takes time. And right now, we know in many situations in parts of the public services, there are problems that are immediate and real and costly to fix. So I'll ask again, do you think that public services in this country need more money if they're to improve? Well, a Labour government always 
uh, will invest in our public services. That's what we question. did in record. Would a Labour government spend more money on public services? Labour governments always invest in our public services. But I don't want to lose this point, Laura, because one of the big problems of the last 13 years is that there hasn't been any long-term thinking. There hasn't been the reform to go with it. it take the NHS. Uh, the strains on the NHS are very different to the strains 75 years ago. So we have to reform and change the NHS so it's fit for the future. If all we do is simply patch up and keep going, then we won't fix the fundamentals. And that's why reform is so important. And, and nobody watching this, I think, would say reform things shouldn't, don't need to change. But I want to press you on the specific point because people in your party want to know, people who work in the public services want to know, would a Labour government spend more money on public services. Do you believe, after years of saying austerity has damaged the public sector, do you believe that part of the answer has to be more money? Uh, a Labour government will always want to invest in its public services. That's but not that's, an answer that, to my question. Well, the way to invest in our public services is to grow our economy. Let me give you the example of the last Labour government. We've now had 13 years of this government, more or less. We've had 13 years of the last Labour government. Last Labour government grew the economy and had tens of billions of pounds more to spend on our public services. That's what I want to replicate, to grow our economy so we've got that yield to put into our public services. But that has to start with responsible economics and it has to be coupled with reform. There are so many things that need reform. Earlier in the discussion, mm. the, you know, two of the panellists saying housing. Mm. Well, we've got to reform. If we want to do house building, we've got to be tough enough to deal with planning, which is holding back housing. We are prepared to be tough on, on planning to make sure we get the houses that we need. But you raise that example, and your Shadow Chancellor, Rachel Reeves, told us in that chair last week that they wouldn't spend taxpayers' money on building houses. And lots of people think that has to be part of the answer. I talk to lots of house builders um, and ask them, what's the problem with house building? And they say, Kira, it's two things. First, Rishi Sunak has taken down the targets for housing. So house building is going to drop, likely to drop, to the lowest level since the Second World War. And secondly, they say it's a planning problem. We can't get through the planning. It takes too long. It's too cumbersome. And therefore, we can't get the houses that we need in the places that we need them. Mm -hmm. We've got to fix that. And we're determined to carry out that sort of reform. Equally on reform, um, on uh, clean energy by 2030. And you put to me, quite rightly, the challenge of the, the immediate problems that people have to deal with. Energy bills would be one of them. But insulating our homes has been something which we knew 10 years ago we needed to do. The government stopped all that when David Cameron said he wouldn't have any more green crap. And now people are paying more money for their homes than they would have been if we'd got on with it. So if all you ever do is the sticking plaster, the short term, don't fix the fundamentals, then we won't improve our country going forward. And you've made it very clear that you want to make those long term changes and then the short term there isn't going to be the spending taps turned on. You've made that very clear. I just wonder, would you be relaxed about someone calling you a fiscal conservative? Well, I'm a responsible Labour, uh, you know, politician, and I want a responsible Labour government. So it's but not if the someone said, you know what, Keir Starmer, he, he, he's very clear, you have to grow the economy before you start spending loads of money, that means he's a fiscal conservative. Would you have a problem with that? I, I don't really want to get into the discussion what other people might call it. I want to explain my position, which is... What I'm asking that question. It's an interesting point because a lot of people in the Labour movement, union leader Sharon Graham from Unite was very vocal over the weekend, saying she wants you to be more ambitious, yeah. she wants you to put more money in. Would you be relaxed about someone saying that you're a fiscal conservative? Well, look, I don't mind what label people put on me. I do want to make my argument. My argument is this. Um, what was absolutely plain from last year's mini budget was if you lose control of the economy, it's working people who pay. Go back to your opening shots, though, that list of people, women saying, I've downsized so much, I have to go to a shoebox next. I was in Selby at the beginning of the by-election campaign, spoke to a woman called Alice. She's got an 11-month-old uh, baby. They'd just got a house that they were going to move to near her parents so that there could be help with the babysitting, etc. The mortgage went up, the mortgage rates went up. She can't afford it. She's now stuck. These are human stories. So I start with responsible economics, because if you lose control of the economy, it's working people who pay the price. That does not mean we can't have a bold and reforming Labour government if we're prepared to take the tough decisions in relation to reform, decisions that haven't been taken for many, many years. So let's have a think then about a few specific things that that Labour government you want to form would do. Um, 
if you have more than two children at the moment, you don't get benefits. Would that change under a Labour government? We're not changing that policy. You're not changing the two-child benefit child, two child policy benefits. Okay, housing benefit has been frozen since 2010, while rents have gone up and up and up. Would you unfreeze housing benefit? Well, we will set that out closer to the election, Laura, when we set out our cost and spend. Now. I'm not committing to that here. I'm not writing our manifesto here. Would a Labour government look at the inflation target at the Bank of England? There's been some suggestions it should go from 2% up to 4%. Would you look at it? Well, again, that's something, I think, for us to address closer to the election. We've got probably two, maybe three fiscal events before the election. Mm -hmm. um, we need to wait until we see what the but state of the economy is. That could is. be on the table because a lot of economists are very interested in whether that target might have to move. Well, look, I'm not making policy here in the studio, Laura. We will, as you would expect, wait until all the fiscal events before the election are there and clear, and then we will be absolutely transparent about what we will do. And would you, as Ollie Dugmore suggested, have a target of building a million homes a year to crack housing shortage in this country once and for all? Well, I've got a massive ambition when it comes to houses. I'm not going to put an arbitrary figure on it, but we need hundreds of thousands more counts, uh, uh, houses. I don't shy away from that. The inhibitor there is the planning regulations. And um, this government is not going to do anything about the planning regulations. We will do something about that. We'll get house building going. And that will be doubly important. One, for the aspirations of so many individuals, young people and their families. The security of owning your own home really matters. But also, it's very, very good for the economy to build houses. So we're absolutely determined to do that. Now, when you ran for leader, one of your 10 pledges was that there was no issue more important to our future than the climate emergency. Do you still believe that? Yes, I think it's probably the single most important issue. So if you really believe that, our viewer Elsa Reynolds wants to know this question. She asks you, have you seen the temperatures in Spain? Yes. Have you seen what is happening? Why are you then delaying your green agenda to combat climate change when we haven't any time to lose? Well, we've got a massive agenda when it comes to climate change. Which you're delaying. £28 well, billion pounds of spending is not now going to happen in the first year if you win the election. The target date for clean electricity of 2030 has not been moved. That will be a massive step in the right direction when it comes to the climate. It will also deliver um, cheaper bills, um, security, so Putin can't put his boot on our throat, and the next generation of but jobs. So we spending, but you are delaying the spending of the 28 billion. You say that's because of the difficulties in the economy, but if you really believe it's the number one problem, why don't you just say, let's borrow what we need to borrow. Let's get on with it. Let's not delay. Well, Laura, what I would say is uh, it's the outcome that matters, that clean electricity, clean power by 2030. That's the outcome that hasn't been delayed. That is there. That's the commitment. As to the funding, I the funding doesn't deliver you, isn't the sole issue by spending the money. What we've done is we've looked at, obviously, the... Uh, amount that it costs to borrow. We're now in a different position because of the damage that the Tories have done to our economy. And we've also talked to those that we will partner with about how effectively we can achieve that goal of 2030. But the, the suggestion that the goal itself, which is what matters, can we get to clean energy, clean power by 2030, that the goal has changed. It hasn't. And that's going to be tough. And you can see that you know, if you look at the Inflation Reduction Act mm -hmm. in America, mm -hmm. um, they're racing ahead with mm -hmm. this, and uh, the EU is now responding. Our government is sitting it out, saying we don't much like what's going and on so, and, elsewhere. And, so you've made and that, that means that, that we won't be on the pitch, we won't win the race for the next Which generation would be why of jobs. Some of your critics in your own party would say that you have to get, get on with it, but you've a answered that question. Um, did you say that you hated tree huggers? No, I didn't say that. Did you say anything uh, like that? Where did I, I, that come I'll from? I'll tell then? you exactly the point I was making. I went to Scunthorpe, to the steelworks there. And the workforce there are desperate to go green. And what I said to the Shadow Cabinet and to others is, they're not tree huggers, they're not gluing themselves to the road, they haven't got placards, but they're absolute evangelists for green steel because they know that all of their orders are for green steel. They know that their jobs depend on going green and the jobs of the next generation in steel. And they said to me, what we need here is one, uh, a leader who understands this. We need a plan to go to electric furnaces, which we can do in three years. We need some match funding. And then they added this, which was really important. Mm -hmm. They said that in Scunthorpe, they thought they could get there by 2027, but the grid wouldn't then connect them till 2034. So you don't and so there for me was a, a sort of practical explanation of the change that an incoming government, I'm determined 
to get to grips with the planning, with the and, green and you've steel, made that point. So the you don't, grid you don't, to make sure that we can actually preserve so, so those jobs. So you've made the point that, that you don't hate So I was simply you? saying they're not, you know, this workforce, you can imagine the Scunthorpe steel workers, they're not, they're not tree huggers, but they are very, very determined to go green. And you've said before, so you don't hate tree huggers, but you've said also that you don't approve of how Just Stop Oil, the protest no, group, I don't. behaves. Why then do some of people in your team meet with them, engage with them? You know that the Conservatives are calling on you to stop that happening. Oh, they haven't been meeting and engaging with them. There was some nonsense story, I think, in the mail today. Um, I've not met them. My team aren't meeting them. Uh, it's a complete distraction. What they're doing is disruptive. It is interfering with the lives of many, many people. It's arrogant. I think the single most effective way to... Uh, do what we need to do when it comes to the climate emergency is to have a Labour government committed to clean power by 2030 and the other commitments that we've made. Don't some people have the right to protest though? I mean, in the Labour Party, people don't tend to believe in the right to protest. Some of your members of your party, some people, MPs in Parliament, think that you should be protesting more about the environment. Well, of course there's the right to protest, but it's not an absolute right. It doesn't mean you can simply do what you like and say there's a right to protest. Um, it's always been a balanced right, which means that, yes, there's a right to protest, but you've got to bear in mind the impact on other people. And when you, when you stand in a road or block a road, when ambulances need to get there... My mum was very ill for mm -hmm. uh, you know, most of her life, as you know, um, and had to travel in, house, in ambulances to hospital. And many people watching this will have a similar mm -hmm. experience. The idea that you can simply arrogantly stand in front of an ambulance and stop it getting to hospital, I think is wrong. So there's no absolute right to protest. Because I, you know, anyone can stand and say, because I'm protesting, you can't touch me. That's never been the case. We've talked a bit about some of your pledges you made when you were running to be leader. You have ditched some of them. Um, some people in the Labour Party also feel that they've been ditched. And um, our viewer, Alex Fiddis, says, I'm not sure how I'll vote in the next general election. It seems to me like Starmer's playing a political game in order to win power, which means abandoning some of the left-wing principles he held previously. What do you say to Alex? And what do you say to people in the Labour Party, like the mayor in the northeast of England, Jamie Driscoll, who's been told he's not welcome, other well-known activists like Neil Lawson, who's under investigation? I mean, you're ditching people as well as ditching policies, aren't you? Right, I reject that. I reject that. I made a central promise to the Labour Party when I stood to be leader. That central promise was, if you elect me in as leader of our party, I will turn our party, I will change our party, and I'll make sure that um, we can head into the next election and we can win it, that we're electorally credible. That was my central promise to the Labour Party. And every day I've been leader since then, I have been changing the Labour Party to put us in a position where we are now credible contenders and for the next election. And if that ruffles election. feathers, is that worth it to you in order to have a chance to govern? Of course. The Labour Party was created to give working people not just representation in Parliament, but a government in Parliament that can govern on their behalf and change the lives of millions of people for and, the better. And you have made very significant progress. You know, as we said at the beginning, when you became leader, many people believed the idea that Labour would be on course to win the election. Well, they shook me by the hand or said, surprised. good luck, but you're never going to do it in five years. So where do you feel you're at now on this journey? And can I ask you, you know, what do you feel might go wrong? You know, you've been ahead for a long time, a solid and sustained yeah. lead. Well, look, as you know, I've always seen this it task in um, sequential steps. The first thing we needed to do was to change the Labour Party. If you lose as badly as we did in 2019, you don't look at the electorate and say, what on earth were you doing? You look at your party and say, we need to change. And we needed to do that first. And of course, I had lots of people then saying, go faster, be bolder. I knew we had to do the change. The second bit is we had to expose the government as not fit to govern. Obviously, we've been ably assisted in that by the government itself. The next stage, the stage we're on now is, if not the government, then why you? What's the case for change that you're putting to the country? That's what we're setting out in the missions that I've set out since the beginning of the year. And at this moment... Setting out what the change is. At the moment, I would say we're... We're confident but not complacent. Um, and the biggest danger is complacency. You know, whatever the polls say, I remind myself every day and I remind the Shadow Cabinet that to get from where we landed uh, in 2019 to a one-seat Labour majority at the next election will be a bigger swing than Tony Blair got in, in 1997. That keeps us rooted, which is why I say always fight like you're 5% behind, no complacency, 
On the contrary, we've got to now all be exceptional. OK, Keir Starmer, it's always great to have you with us in the studio. Thanks very much indeed for coming just before your summer break. Now, what did you think of what he had to say? You can let us know. As ever, email me, kunzberg at bbc.co.uk and we'll share some of your views towards the end of the show or use the hashtag on social media if you are that way inclined. And the BBC website, the address is there for you now, has the headlines of our conversations as we go on. Um, Andrea, what did you make of what you heard there? I'm, I'm just head in hands because, you know, on just two points on the Just Stop Oil, you know, Keir's talking about um, how he totally rejects blah, 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 blah. But they didn't back, they voted against time and time and time again in the House of Commons when we were trying to create new laws to enable the police to stop those people gluing themselves to the road so that his mum and other people's mums can get to hospital. So it's like saying one thing, doing another. It's this flip-flop thing. And look at the green energy. You know, what he's actually proposing is to no new oil and gas licences. So what that does, unless he, he's, he's putting all his bets in one area you lose jobs by doing that you also create massive energy insecurity during this transition and you leave yourself vulnerable to gas imports what, what from russia what, where, where does he want us to get that from and yet what he's not acknowledging is that it is the uk the conservative government since 2010 that have led to us being half the world's offshore deployed wind 99 of course the government's own climate change has well of course the government's own climate change committee recently said actually the uk was now risking falling behind some of the good progress that it had risking made falling Ollie, behind but it's been brilliant progress Ollie, we, we are ahead of the g20 with the exception of denmark in our decarbonization efforts Ollie, what did you make what you had um Interesting. I thought um, he started off, your, I think your first question to him, you asked him whether he was going to be radical in government. He answered yes and then didn't really commit to very much uh, throughout the rest of the interview, did he? I uh, also critical for different reasons to Andrea, I suspect. Um, I, the terms of the debate that gets framed around Labour is how are you going to pay for it? Mm -hmm. Where's the money going to come from? I, uh, I reject the terms of that debate pretty strongly because the Conservative Party is able to shake its magic money tree and £7 billion falls down so they can cut inheritance tax. Um, Right now, it has never been, well, ne not never been, but by historical standards, it is cheap to borrow money. The state that the country is in That's at the moment, wrong, may I? And, Andrea, I listen to you. Uh, I'd like it if you listen to me as well. Um, it's cheap. It's cheap to borrow money by historical standards. We have the biggest squeeze on living standards since the Napoleonic Wars. If you invest money in this society, the social good that will come out of it is extraordinary. We have so much to gain. The calculation has to be, yes, financial cost. What do we gain out of it? If you invest money in building houses, right, mm -hmm. you don't just have houses, you improve crime outcomes, you improve health outcomes. It's the benefit of our society to make these changes. Well, it's interesting here, Summer very clearly is not in the mood to spend taxpayers' money on building mm. houses, for example. But Sharon, I know these two aren't going to agree on that. So as, a, as an economist, um, is it possible right now is it smart right now to borrow money to do the kinds of things that Keir Starmer might want to do but at the moment thinks is not right to spend money on I think that the space to spend um, significant investment has got tighter I mean interest interest rates are now zooming up to six percent they were two percent you know even a year ago so the space is much tighter but at the same time, there, is, there are really big actions, I think, that any government can take. So for me, one of the things I was surprised mm. not to hear more about is, is crime. Um, crime linked to the cost of living. So, you know, the John Lewis Partnership were a big retailer, 74,000 partners or employees. One of the big issues for them is partner safety. So shoplifting has gone up 26%. 26%? 26% in the last year. So it's a sort of crisis that's hiding in plain sight. So absolutely public service reform, but crime, safety, particularly as you know, gangs and shoplifters have become much bolder, to be frank, um, given some of the, uh, the, the cost of living pressures. And you think that is happening, in your view, clearly, because people are finding it harder and yeah, harder to make ends meet. This, yeah. is, this is kind of the point I'm talking about, though, right? We have, if, I'm sure we can all look around us, look at British society, and see that it's atrophying. It's decaying. Shoplifting is increasing. All sorts of crime statistics are through the roof. You know, um, you could talk about serious sexual offences. You know, the rape conviction rate appalling. Right? Things in this society aren't working. And we can either sit here and say, right, well, interest rates are pretty high, so maybe we can't borrow enough money, or we can actually have the courage and the conviction to try and improve society for the better. Do you want to be a political leader that leads, or do you want to triangulate and say, well, can't really and borrow? And do you think that the demographic that you understand best, Ollie, is looks at Keir Starmer and think there is a leader? Uh, no. 
Interesting. No. Sharon, I want to ask you about John Lewis because we've used your expertise as an economist, but of course your, your day job at the moment is being the boss of John Lewis. And it's been, I think, a, a bumpy year for John mm. Lewis, it's fair to say. Um, Earlier in the year, there was a suggestion that you might change the structure, its famous partnership model. And Andy Street, your predecessor, now Tory mayor for Birmingham, sat in that street, that seat and said, basically, that would be a disaster. Now, do you regret floating the idea of changing things there? Um, so there was never any question that we were going to change the partnership model. So the partnership, the fact that our 74,000 employees and members of the business is what makes us special. I think it's the reason why um, shoppers love um, shopping at Waitrose and John Lewis. The issue for us is um, 10 years ago in the sort of 2000s, the business got much, much bigger. Um, we doubled the number of John Lewis stalls, we tripled the number of Waitrose stalls. We're a much bigger business uh, without access to external finance. So the question for us now as a 20, 12 and a half billion pound business is how do we how do we fund the growth that we know is there, whether that's, um, but doing that in a creative way that keeps the partnership a partnership. But can you give people a 100% guarantee that the business will be solely owned by its employees always? It sounds like that's not what you're saying. There's still the possibility of cash coming in from elsewhere. So I can give a 100% guarantee that the partnership will always be a partnership. We have always found creative ways while staying a membership organisation to bring external financing. So Ocado is a, is a great case in point where we set up a separate private company so that we could expand into Waitrose. We're doing built to rent, we talked a bit about the housing crisis and we're, John Lewis is trying to do our part in terms of tackling the housing crisis, we're trying to do 10,000 new homes. That's been funded by Aberdeen which is a great investment fund. So no ifs, no buts, absolute guarantee that the partnership will remain a partnership. But you might still be having money coming in from outside. I want to also show our viewers, I think we can see some pictures of possibly the most polite Just Stop Oil <laughs> protest you've ever seen in your life. There was a Just Stop Oil protest in John Lewis. Um, now, what did you think of when you saw that? Were you, were, were you, you know, what, what kind of happened? Were you there? I wasn't there, although we spoke to the, the, um, Paul, who's the sort of amazing um, branch manager in Oxford Street, Oxford Street's my, my local John Lewis store. It was a very polite protest. So we had about 12 protesters and a, and a megaphone. And I think at some stage, either one of the partners or customers asked the, the, the just all protester with the megaphone to stop, um, um, to stop blasting, and they stopped. And I think most customers just sort of continued in That's quite a sort of blase. Kind of British polite it was very to British. protest. Andrea, briefly, what do you think when you see those pictures? I mean, they're not radical people disrupting people. They're, they're standing quietly in John Lewis. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, I firmly believe in the right to protest, but actually what we've seen in recent years, I mean, as Ollie says, you know, the whole age of kind of courtesy and being you know allowing other people to get on with their lives i mean i it basically goes back to the fact of do you have the right to protest over and above someone else's right to go to work to get to hospital to go about their life and in, in my view the answer to that is no but a quiet protest like that you know maybe the they, they weren't even blocking people getting to the towels exactly. they were just standing there very politely okay all three of you thank you very much indeed for now we'll be back with you a bit later in the program now we just heard from someone who wants very much to be Prime Minister. This time last year, someone else fancied that job too. That was Kemi Badenoch, and she was a favourite for many Tory party members, but she ended up as Trade Secretary and Minister for Equalities under Rishi Sunak. Not so bad for someone who only became an MP in 2017. She's in New Zealand, where she has just signed off our membership of one of the world's biggest trading blocs, the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific partnership if you can get all of that out in a one -er, well done to you um kemi thank you very much indeed for joining us it's great to have you on the program for the first time if people are watching Hello. this morning why should they Hi, care about the deal that you've just done uh oh they should care about uh the deal it is it's it's quite a momentous occasion and we're all here so proud so excited it's been five years since the idea to join cptpp as, as we call it first uh first started and now we have signed the agreement. This is the, um, 
it's the fastest growing region, the Asia Pacific. Uh, it's going to be responsible for at least 50% of the global growth that we're expecting between now and 2035. And countries have been queuing up to join uh, this, this trading bloc. We've got there first, we've got our seat at the table. And it is uh, for the UK, it's actually quite a momentous thing. It's the biggest uh, trade deal we signed since we left the EU and there's everything to play for. But the government's own assessment says that it'll only add 0.08% to GDP. I mean, are viewers really going to feel any difference as a result of this? They will. They will if they use it. And the assessment that we made, it was a scoping assessment. It's just a very broad brush, sort of static modelling. It doesn't look at so many things. It's not specifically about trade deals. We use it for all sorts of things. Uh, it doesn't look at the future growth that's coming in. And it also doesn't look at how we utilise um, how we utilize the agreement. And this is why it's so important that I explain to people how significant it is. If we don't use it, then it'll become a self-fulfilling prophecy. This is uh, a forecast that's only as good as uh, the way that we utilize it and one of the things that we need to remember is that there are 11 countries in in there who are making up about 500 uh, million people that's so so much potential that's where the middle class is coming from you look at the countries that are queuing up the US uh, was going to join until uh, they had a change of administration they're not doing free trade agreements anymore but we are uh, this is global Britain the world is our oyster. We are not isolated. We're not insular. Should People China be allowed be part to, of this fantastic? Should block. China be allowed to join? Well, this is one of the things that we've been discussing. So uh, we finally had our seat at the table, one of the 12 countries, talking about the principles for accession. And what the bloc is doing is making sure that it's the countries that meet the high standards of the uh, of the CPTPP that will be allowed to join. So that's something that needs to needs to be assessed. Does a country meet the high standards? Is it ready? Does it uh, keep its commitment, its, its trading commitments, whether at the WTO or elsewhere? But some of and your colleagues quite frankly, want you to be explicit today. I think and it's veto more, China. Uh, uh, sorry, Laura, just a, just, a, just a moment, just a moment, Laura. One of the things that's really important, we've just joined today. When you join a club, the very first thing you don't do is tell uh, the other club members who should be or shouldn't be allowed to, to, to join. It's okay. how we're going to make use of it that's going to be significant and yes being the first at the, uh, first at the table means that we will have an influence but I'm not going to go into any specific country's merits that's for all of us to do as a consensus team. It's worth our viewers knowing though that some prominent conservatives like Liz Truss think that you should make clear that China would not be allowed to join in the future but I hear you're not going to get into that this morning. This is the biggest deal that we have uh, signed no, no, since Brexit not. as you said but there is no sign of that American trade deal that is promised the trade deal with India seems to be stalled. That Brexit promise of a sort of buccaneering Britain massively benefiting from trading around the world, that just has not come to pass, has mm -hmm. it? Uh, that's, that's absolutely not true. First of all, remember back in 2018, 2019, people saying that we wouldn't even be able to get the existing agreements that we had uh, in the EU. We got them. People laughed at us when we said we were going to join CPTPP. The Westminster bubble laughing and not believing that this could happen. We've done it. Yes, you are right that we haven't uh, had a free trade agreement with the US, but that's, been because there's, that's because there's been a change of administration in the US and they're not signing free trade agreements with anyone. They were going to join the TPP and they're not, uh, they're not doing that. We can't force other countries to do things that are different from what they want to do. They're a sovereign country just as we are. But that they're was a promise that was made to, to British to voters. And actually, just, just, uh, just, uh, uh, Laura, Laura, that was uh, an agreement that was had with the previous president. You cannot force countries to join free trade agreements. So and it was a promise then India that you were never going true. to be able look to at keep. What the, uh, Laura, please stop. Laura, please stop. Please stop interrupting me. You said that uh, trade talks with India had stalled. That is not true. The Indian trade minister gave an interview with the FT just last week saying how well things were going. He was in the UK last week. These things take time because if we get them wrong, you would be accusing me of signing deals that were not worth the paper they were written on. But so I'm making the effort to get things right. That doesn't mean things are stalled. And as for the US, while we may not have an FTA, 
We have other things that are going on, economic security arrangements. You look at what the PM did with the Atlantic Declaration. You look at the trade dialogues we're having, a lot of the things that we're doing on security with Five Eyes around the world. There's so much that you can do outside an FTA. And what we're doing is making sure that we continue to build a closer, stronger relationship with those countries. And so that, I think, is what people can see uh, now that we've left the EU. And I think it is uh, impossible to ignore the significance of CPTPP, which is a great benefit of leaving the EU, given that we still have an EU free trading agreement. And that is an important deal, and we are dealing with a delay on the line. So we should just explain that to our viewers. It's making the communication slightly different. But people can also see, Minister, that trade as a percentage of GDP has fallen at double the rate of the other G7 countries. Now, the CPTPT may be an important new deal, but you have not been able mm -hmm. to keep some of the promises that were made to the public, that American deal, that Indian deal, those promises have not been kept. Well, we're still, we're still in the middle of the uh, India Free Trade Agreement. What the British public wants is a deal that's going to be of benefit to the UK. We're not just going to sign any free trade agreement just to say, here, here's a piece of paper. We're going to make sure that it is something that is of benefit to our country. And yes, uh, it was expected that we would sign an FTA with the US, but that was with a different president. You cannot force a country to do something if its administration changes. Let's ask about something that this government does have the power to do. Many businesses are finding it harder mm. to trade in this economic climate. Now, the government's due to impose extra charges, maybe more than £40, on goods coming in from the EU from October. Might you consider delaying that, or is that definitely going to happen? Well, this is something that we're looking at uh, in the round. We need to make sure that we have a level playing field uh, for our businesses, for our exporters, uh, and making sure that they're not being undercut by other countries. Obviously, we recognise this is very difficult. We also recognise that um, there, is a lot of, uh, there is high inflation at the moment. There is a cost of living uh, crisis. So we're not going to do anything that's going to make things harder for people. That is the guarantee. But within uh, the specifics of what's happening uh, at the border, that's not something that I can go into because we haven't finalised the arrangements. But we are aware of concerns. We're taking them into account. And I think what I would want your viewers to know is that the government uh, is making sure that we are trying to lift the burdens uh, off people and not put uh, more burdens on. Okay. And that means making sure that we're not undercutting our own producers from imports, but also looking at prices uh, for goods across the board. You are also the Minister for Equalities, and it is expected this week after some time that we will see the guidance for schools on how they should best support trans pupils, young people identifying as trans. Should teachers have to tell parents if children want to change their gender? Yes, so we are producing guidance for uh, schools to uh, know how to deal with children who are experiencing gender distress. And I can't go into the specifics of what is going to be in the guidance, but what you can uh, let your viewers know, what your viewers can be reassured of, is that we're doing everything we can to bring clarity. There is quite a lot of confusion about what the law says, and it is important that parents are aware of what's going on with their children and what's happening to them at school. So what we're doing is uh, making sure that we have robust guidance that's going to be able to stand up to scrutiny, and that will be coming shortly. Is it possible, though, that we have a situation where trans pupils might feel that teachers are outing them to their parents, even against their wishes? Uh, well, I think we need to make sure that we don't speculate too much on what's going to be in the guidance. It's best read in, uh, in totality and within context. The fact is that this is not a trivial thing. This is uh, very different from sexual orientation. And what is right is that parents know what is going on with their children at school. It is not uh, for teachers to parent. It is for parents to parent. And we're giving guidance to make sure that everyone is getting the balance right. Um, reports yesterday suggested that the Conservatives might look at scrapping inheritance tax. Um, would you support that? I think this is uh, the usual tax speculation. There are always people who have uh, suggestions about what we can or may do on taxes. 
The fact is, it's the Chancellor who does those, uh, who makes those decisions. He will do, make decisions out of fiscal statement. I can't comment on inheritance tax. It's not something that I am currently working on. What we are focusing on is bringing down inflation. That is the thing that is having the most impact on people's disposable income. And just lastly, we were talking to Keir Starmer earlier about why he wants to be Prime Minister. And this time last year, you wanted to be Prime Minister. And you were very popular among Conservative members. Do they still tell you they'd like to see you in number 10 one day? No, what people tell me is that um, they're very pleased with what I'm doing uh, with my business and trade brief and with the, equalities, uh, with the equalities brief as well. And I'm very happy being business and trade secretary. That is 100% what my focus is on and making sure that Rishi Sunak has all the support that he needs to be able to deliver his five priorities in this government. Kemi Baynock, thank you so much for joining us all the way from New Zealand. It's great to have you on the programme for the first time. Hope we see you thank back you, here Laura. soon. Thank you, now, also down, down under, the Lionesses are there getting ready for the Women's Football World Cup, which is about to start in New Zealand and Australia. Here they are training in Queensland, hoping to repeat their amazing victory in last year's Euros. So many of us, football fan or not, got caught up in the women's game for the first time during the Euros. But did it change the status of the game for good, as the Lionesses hoped? Well, Sarah Walsh, a former Matilda, the Aussie women's team, is one of the hosts in Australia. And I spoke to her a bit earlier this morning. We won the right to host this Women's World Cup in, back in 2020, and um, it was always more than just delivering, you know, really good football on the park. It was always about leaving a legacy for our, our code here in Australia. And, you know, we, we wanted this to be big, and, and hosting Women's World Cup really stacks up to, you know, what we delivered here in, in 2000. We, we hosted the Sydney Olympics here. In terms of how women footballers are treated differently, though, there's a, a, a curious thing recently. Lots of female players are getting ACL injuries, a particular injury, and there's some suggestion that that's partly because manufacturers aren't thinking through how women's bodies are different, the kind of boots that they need, that they're sort of not, not given the right appropriate treatment in the way that male players kit. Should manufacturers have a harder think about the kind of kit and equipment that female players need? I think at the heart of the issue, it's not manufacturers, it's actually research, the real lack of research. The entire high performance environment is built around men, designed by men for men. Um, you know, for a long time, women have been treated like little men. Um, you know, I would have loved to have known if my menstrual cycle had have contributed to any one of my knee reconstructions, um, you know, and I think until we better understand, you know, how women's biology is different, how do we know uh, that our hip structure isn't different and that we should be something different in our prehab? And we haven't even scratched the surface and it's 100 years under investment in women's football has put us in this point where we've lost a number of different players for this World Cup, which is a shame we won't get to see them. But, um, yeah, it's, it's something that we really need to invest. Uh, in research. In terms of the tournament itself, so the Lionesses and the Matildas, the Australian players, are not in the same group to start with, but of course they might meet further down. I've got to ask you, who would win? <laughs> oh, look, I'm not going to speculate on, on that match. I'd love as a, as a spectator watching the game. I think that'd be way too early for these two powerhouses to meet. And, you know, going off the previous match, I think that um, they learn a lot from that match. And, um, you know, if, if we do come up against them, I think fans would absolutely love it. And there is now going to be these matches on some on ITV and some on the BBC, but the time difference for viewers in this country is quite tricky. If, if people might be thinking, you know, I'd just rather get my head down and stay in bed, why would you tell them to set the alarm to watch this tournament? We're in this really fascinating place here with women's football. It's starting to break new ground and challenge the status quo, and you would have seen that with, you know, the broadcast rights, uh, FIFA is a, a rights holder, you know, in many of the, the big markets in Europe, they held their ground to, to really extract the right value because if we continue to, to undersell these rights, you know, the ecosystem won't, won't correct around it. And I think, you know, I think that's really interesting. We're in this moment where women's sport and these female athletes are breaking new ground. And I think there's other industries that will benefit from this change. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Enjoy the tournament very much. It's great to have you on the show. And we've had a few little gremlins with our sound talking to people down under on the other side of the world. But Sarah Walsh, they're one of the hosts of the Aussie Women's World Cup. Good luck to all the teams. The first game is on the BBC next Saturday. 
Now it is nearly 10 o'clock and remember we started the programme asking what kind of Prime Minister Keir Starmer really wants to be. Last Labour government grew the economy and had tens of billions of pounds more to spend on our public services. That's what I want to replicate, to grow our economy so we've got that yield to put into our public services. But that has to start with responsible economics and it has to be coupled with reform. Growth first, spending next was his message. So what did you think of it? Well, James Stevenson wrote, Keir Starmer doesn't have any answers to anything. The answers to the doctor strike today is not to grow the economy tomorrow. Brian Kirk said it's no good building houses if the people who need them can't afford them. We need reform of the way people pay for the houses they want to buy. But Colin says, I don't want houses built near me. My town has grown by 30% in the last 10 years. A flavour there of some of the classic dilemmas when politicians look at the housing shortage. Um, Sharon White, I firstly want to ask you about Kemi Badenoch signed the UK up to a big new trading block. Will it make a difference to the economy? I think it's obviously a positive. I think, as you said in your discussion, it's not, you know, it's not going to be a sub gangbusters, gangbusters substantial shift. I have to say, the thing I'd love to hear more as we sign new tech trade deals is what this is doing for British farmers and ensuring that we're not undercutting British farmers, we're not undercutting, you know, great animal welfare standards in this country that we've had for many, many years. And I'd love to hear more about that in future. And as someone who has a big food retailer mm -hmm. as part of the business you run, is that an anxiety you have? I know it, a lot of farmers have that worry. No, it is. I mean, Waitrose, is, is, as you know, is, you know, is the highest rated across the world for animal welfare standards. So I would not want the UK to be signing up to deals that undercut the nutrition, the great sourcing, the great sustainability. I think that matters to, to many people. But shoppers want lower bills. I mean, at the moment, people are struggling and Waitrose, if you forgive me, is certainly at the top end of their yeah, scale. Although it's interesting, our customers are also saying, so if you're feeding a family, actually you want great quality as well. Obviously, mm. you're choiceful about value, um, but I don't think we want chlorinated chicken. Um, coming across our shores. Ollie, by the time politicians come back in September, do you think things will have changed much? What do you reckon? Uh, no, not necessarily. Uh, I, listening to Keir Starmer there, I heard quite a lot of orthodoxy, growth, jobs, economy. Look around you, has the orthodoxy got you anywhere? That's what I'd say. In terms of, what do you mean by that? Well, the language that he uses of difficult decisions, uh, it's sort of aping the Conservative Party, right? And the economic orthodoxy of the last, well, probably since post Thatcher, right? We live in Thatcher's Britain, her economic settlement. Um, does the country, if you're, I'm talking to the audience here, does the country feel like something is working? Does it feel like you want to be here? Does it feel like life is better? If it's not, does more of the same suit you? I would say no, it doesn't. The Conservatives, Andrea, certainly know, looking at their poll ratings, that people are not happy with a lot of the way things are happening in the country. What's your prediction of what the next couple of months will look like? Well, what's for certain is that the Prime Minister is completely focused on his top priorities, which are halving inflation, getting the economy growing, getting debt reducing... I was wondering if you were going to do getting five NA pledges. <laughs> down, ...and also stopping the small boats. And that combination of priorities actually will turn things around. We, are, we have faced the most well extraordinary... So well, but we have faced the most extraordinary last few years with the COVID pandemic and with uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine. And yet the UK in real GDP terms has grown faster since 2010 than any comparable EU nation, France, um, Spain, Italy. And so we can be proud of that. But I do think, Ollie's right, I do think that there is more to life than simply looking at GDP mm -hmm. growth. And so some of the reform ideas that the government's looking at that net zero transition, so yep. on, absolutely crucial. OK, well, people do like things to be cheerful about as well. So we did have a word about the Women's World Cup after lots of tough discussions about politics. But it's been great having the three of you with us this morning. Why have one dame when you could have two? I don't think we've had two dames at the table with me before. <laughs> great to have Ollie Dugmore, Dame Andrea. I'll add some Dame Sharon White with you. Thank you to all of them. And thank you, of course, for watching, not just this morning, but as we leave you for the summer break, thank you for watching for the last few months for all your emails and messages and your company every Sunday morning. It's been a spring and summer where the Tories have not been able to catch a break and Labour has stayed way out in front. Remember the Lib Dems and the Greens picked up momentum in those local elections not so long ago, while in Scotland the SNP has fallen into real trouble. But more than anything else though, the profound problems of the economy have been laid bare and the questions about who has the ideas to help the country make a living are only going to get louder. 
until September. There is tons you can watch back on the iPlayer, maybe our encounter with Arnold Schwarzenegger, the Prime Minister, or Keir Starmer from this morning. We will be back on the first Sunday in September, so stick it in your diary. And then I will see you same time, same place. Take care and goodbye till September.